Simon's algorithm is a transition from the past to the future. Like our early algorithms, it's relatively elementary and not very applicable to any practical problem. However, it adds three new dimensions that have been absent thus far, dimensions that pop up frequently in quantum solutions to real-world problems. First, we'll get to apply the fully generalized Born rule to a much more realistic order n superposition state. Also, we finally encounter a probabilistic technique designed directly into the algorithm. Grown-up problems rarely yield deterministic single evaluation solutions. Simon teaches us how to accept a small possibility of failure, sample the circuit an indeterminate number of times, and still converge on an answer polynomial fast. Most importantly, it's an exponential speedup of a classical algorithm even when that algorithm is solved probabilistically. This problem is emblematic of a class of problems that seek to find the unknown period of a periodic function. For those of you unfamiliar with those terms, I'll get to them in a moment, but first the headlines. Settling most periodicity issues is a, quote, hard problem for classical computers. Those solutions tend to have an exponential big O. Simon's algorithm solves a particular periodicity problem and does it polynomial fast. And more importantly, it provides a blueprint for the solution to universally applicable and naturally occurring periodicity questions. Now onward to periodicity. That term characterizes a kind of repetition. If you've ever seen the graph of a trig function like sin x or tan x, you probably know about ordinary periodicity of real functions. But the thing that makes Simon's problem an easy case study is the very thing that makes it a little hard to explain to the average person. It addresses a quirky kind of periodicity, so we have to burn a few pages getting comfortable with this variation. To give you an idea, last week we met the two equivalent number systems, the integers z sub 2 to the n, and the vector space z sub 2 all to the n. If you'll recall, they had an unusual mod 2 component-wise addition. Well, in Simon's problem, we're given a function that's periodic in this z 2 to the n sense, and we're asked to find a period a. You'll read the precise definitions of all these terms and study some short examples to reinforce the concepts. Among other things, z2 to the n periodicity endows functions with the property that they're 2 to 1, which says that the function can be used to separate the domain into two equal parts, or cosets. This partitioning is not only key to the solution, but a warm-up for the n to 1 partition that will come across in two weeks when we get to Shor's period finding. The next step is to explore the circuit that drives the algorithm. The good news? It looks very much like the circuits of previous algorithms. Still, it has important differences. The lower channel is wider, transporting n qubits rather than 1. Also, the state we're sending into the Oracle's B register? It's ket0 rather than ket1. That second point shifts the entire emphasis away from the phase kickback, which doesn't help us here, to the much more widely applicable generalized Born rule. We'll eventually settle on the output of the top register, which we've massaged into a form suitable for measurement. We'll measure it, and guess what we get? We get a state that's orthogonal in the oddball mod 2 sense to our unknown period A. We'll see exactly why this is, and it won't be too difficult given the math you've studied in the last few weeks. Then we get to the big algorithmic step. We'll repeat this task several times, continuing to generate new mod 2 vectors orthogonal to A, until we've collected n minus 1 of them. We'll add one more vector to that collection, this one not orthogonal to A, producing n equations and n unknowns. Those unknowns are nothing other than the coordinates of our sought-after period A, and after an easy solve, we've nailed it. 
Those last couple moves may have sounded like standard algebra to some of you, but actually there's some touchy issues that have to be handled with care. You see, everything we're doing is in that funny mod 2 vector space with the strange inner product where, for example, half the vector space's vectors are orthogonal to themselves. So we can't apply ordinary algebra blindly. The way we'll approach it is by introducing a classical tool for solving linear equations, then observing that nearly identical techniques work in our mod 2 vector space. In fact, it's actually going to be easier, faster, and take less memory. At this point, we'll know the algorithm, we'll see why it works, and all that will be left is to compute the time complexity. We'll do that first for the quantum solution, which you already know is going to be polynomial, although we'll see exactly what order we're talking about. Then we'll do it with the classical solution, which is horribly exponential. It's actually the mother of all exponential nightmares. The big takeaway is that we get exponential speed up. Yes, it's relativized because we don't know the complexity of the unknown function, but it's exponential speed up over the classical technique. I'll give two time complexity arguments. One that I prefer provides a tighter bound for the time complexity and leaves nothing to the imagination, but it's a little long. The second seems easier and faster to read, but it relies on an esoteric number theory result that we have to take on faith. Plus, it produces a result that makes the algorithm appear to have a worse expected performance than it actually does. That last criticism doesn't matter too much, though, because the algorithm will find the period A with the same likelihood of error based on nature not on how we humans decided to analyze the math behind the circuit. Still, it's nice to be able to predict the convergence of algorithms accurately, which is one of the reasons I like the first argument better. It's a long chapter, and most of this analysis is optional, depending on which of my three path variations you take. Certainly, you can get a feel for Simon by reading a select subset of those 30-plus pages. But if you someday want to design quantum algorithms of your own, you'll need to supply airtight arguments like the ones presented here, at least to yourself, before publishing. Once again, whatever path you take, everything you need is here. You can study it all now, or come back and munch on some of it a little later.